<laughs> Hi guys, I'm Becca Otis from Five Lines Pottery, and I'm located in Van. And I'm Ryan Durbin from RD Ceramics, located in Highland Heights, Kentucky. And welcome to Wheel Talk. All right, I can Howdy. audibly hear the the thud of you clicking it. <laughs> I was like, I'm sick of this shit. <laughs> We got it. We Hi, got it. Hi, Ryan. Hello. It only took us 15, it only took us 17 minutes to figure our shit out and for Ryan to move to sitting on the floor. For me to figure my shit out. I don't know that mm-hmm. you had to figure much out, but. I didn't. Uh, but to be fair, Ryan's in a new location right now, so. Yeah, I'm in Lexington for my art show that I'm doing this weekend, so. Huzzah! Airbnb. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's going to be great. Yeah, I have, have, like, I feel like I have high expectations, but I feel like I need to... Lower them? Lower them because of the time of year. <laughs> like, I don't... Well, I think I've mostly been preparing for the, the wholesale side of it more so than the retail, but I have so much stock that I brought, like, way too much shit. Yeah. Um, and then I only put a certain amount out for wholesale day tomorrow, so... The tables feel a little bare, but I think that's probably okay. Yeah, no, it's good to have concise things, yeah. you know. And then there's certain things that I was like, oh, well, I don't have, you know, I have a list of, like, glaze combos that they can purchase um, for certain forms. And I have most of the combos in most of the forms, but there's, like, a couple that I don't have, like, that combo on an oil bottle or whatever. But right. I think I was overthinking that because the oil bottles they can they can't pick certain colors they have to per- purchase an assortment. But um, yeah, I think I think I'm as prepared as I could be. So it's always the first wholesale show that really gets you. Out. But this is like a small time wholesale show. So yeah, it's only the Friday that's the wholesale day. So um, yeah. Yeah, I was telling Rachel, uh, she came down with me as well. And uh, just because it's a three day, I was like, yeah, I think you should be here. But for the wholesale day, I'm like, I mean, we're not really like wrapping or packing anything. So I don't know like what you're really going to do there. So I told her she could just come early in the morning and then maybe be there for a couple hours and then head out just to make sure that I'm like, yeah, solid for yeah. the rest of the day. And I, I don't know, I feel like tomorrow's going to drag on because how many wholesale buyers could there actually be? A lot. Uh, for 10 to 5, like, I should have asked them how many people register because they have to pre-register Yeah. To, to be there on Friday. So I'm not really sure. But I feel like I did a good job of emailing all of my existing clients to let them know that it was happening. I mean, some of them already knew about it, but some of them are supposed to be there tomorrow. So, uh, that should help. And one, one of the clients is actually picking up an order of oil bottles. So nice. That'll be good. Yeah. That'll be good. Yeah. I, do you ever, well, I know this year you sold earlier, but do you typically sell earlier than April ish in the year? I think I've always had to like, yeah. well, Claycon West has really been a big like money mover for me. Like it, like last year I made like three grand at Claycon West or something like that. So that helped a lot and I didn't have that this year. So, um, but Did so you I sell a done few, a lot of you shows. sold a few things just to some random people, but not like, yeah, it's not the like actual I'm artist like, thing because you didn't present, but yeah, it's not that I'm going to go to Claycon West and be like, I didn't present. Here, buy my shit. Like, that's rude. Um, but yeah, three so, grand is a pretty good, pretty good piece there at that time of year. Right. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so it's been rough. It's been real rough. But um, I had I did a, a Becca B. Poor sale yesterday. I actually... Yeah. What's funny is that I've just been really struggling with, like, selling stuff. And, and, like, some people have been buying things, but just the money's been just going right through the drain. And um, 
right through like the drain. Like when you get it, it's being spent immediately. Yeah, or, or something. I don't know. I. It's just. If it just, you know, I had a certain amount of money and it's all gone, essentially. Like I had a certain amount at Christmas time. And um, I called Sephora last night and I was like, so I was talking about Domino's because I was kind of asking her about her opinion on the price. And um, so and then I we were talking about it. She's like, you know, you should just like put a sale on your Etsy. And I was like, oh. Yeah, I could do that. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. I um because you're you're kind of framing the dominoes like a pre sale pre order. Yeah. But um And I will still do that. I'll do a pre order, but that's like in a week and I didn't have any I had like three hundred dollars in my bank account yesterday. Well, and today. And um which is a lot of money. But you know Is it? How long can that last you? Well, my van payment every week is three hundred dollars. So <laughs> every week. Yeah, I do a weekly payment because it's easier to keep up on. It's a lot. But you pay easier. the you pay the bank weekly. Yeah, it's a lot easier for me to pay three hundred dollars a week than it is for me to pay twelve hundred dollars a month. Seems like a lot. Is that is that just the standard payment? Is twelve hundred dollars a month? No, no. The standard payment is eight hundred dollars. I just pay extra. Oh, okay, okay. I was like, Damn, and I don't want to pay any less. Cost? Yeah. Okay. I don't want to pay. What's the interest rate on that? Because I I would suspect you got it before it was pretty outrageous, but. I did not. It's seven percent. It's like six point seven percent. Oh, is it? Okay. It's rough. So um. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. tough. And so, yeah, so I'm trying to paint down as quickly as possible. And, um, but I like did a Becca B. Poor sale last night and I expected like five people to buy stuff. Do you want to explain you know? to people what that mean, what you mean by that? Oh, that's kind of like a flash sale. Like I used to do flash sales when I had to pay the rent <laughs> and I'd be like, Hey guys, everything is this price, and it'd be like astronomically cheaper. So, on my Etsy, I put everything at twenty five percent off, <laughs> and and the way I see it is, you know, I could sell it to a, a retail twenty five percent off, or I could try and find somebody to wholesale it for fifty percent off. So really, am I losing anything? Like, not much, mm-hmm. you know. So how much uh, do you think? Um, I mean, there's a couple questions I was going to ask here, but I guess first, do you think the price was a, a, a reason people were reluctant to purchase it? Or do you think they saw the, uh, the urgency or the, like, do you think the retail price could have been a sticking point as they were? No, I don't think so. Or do you think it's just like, oh, they want to help you out because it's like... I think a lot of it's a pity buy. Um, and But I do think that making them significantly less is good. Like, it helps with that. Because, um, like, I've done things like, hey, you know, you guys should buy my stuff and not change the price, and nothing's happened. And mm-hmm. so this time I did change the price significantly, like, significantly. 25% is a lot. And... Um, yeah, I got a chunk. 28 sales today. Yeah. So, so how many how many pairs or, or yeah, like how how many pairs is that? Probably like is, 35. 35. Okay. Yeah. Because my if I my, was to guess. my second question or my other was going to be like, I mean, I guess this goes back to price again. If you're willing to go 25 when you're desperate, 25% off, like, what if you dropped it 15% across the board and didn't have it when you need it? You're going to drop it. Like, or like it kind of goes to the thing of, like, would you rather sell fewer at a higher price or would you rather meet, reach more people at a more affordable price for people? I don't know. Or what if every month I do a 25% off sale, just like JCPenney's? JC, <laughs> I feel. What, what do you? 
my other question would be, how do you think customers that pay retail price would feel if they knew that you discounted them every single month? What would incentivize somebody to even pay retail for it? I don't know. I don't know, but I like the idea of doing that. I don't care if everybody buys my stuff just in one week, you know? Do you think you would get more sales if you just had it lower without it being discounted? Or no. or maybe it's just a no. maybe it's just a hey, this is valued at forty five dollars, but for this time being it's twenty five percent off. So it's like a buy. It's a reason for people to buy versus like, oh, these are thirty dollars. I'm willing to pay thirty dollars for these. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like typically like at shows and stuff, nobody even questions price. Like nobody. So why do you think it's harder to sell it online then? Because it's on Etsy. Like, and because what about your customers I, though? Don't you have customers that would be going there from your website or from your yeah, Instagram yeah, but you're, and stuff like that? Or are they not for, buyers for you? You're forgetting that my customers, my current customers are people that are my customers because of pottery, not because of jewelry. So I have to like, ha- I have a hard sell already because I didn't start out in jewelry. So the um, the buying market is not necessarily jewelry wearing people, you know? Mm-hmm. How does that increase? Like, how do you, how do you get more of those buyers? Cause, cause you're already, do you feel like you're in a, you're in a niche space, of one having jewelry and two having ceramic and through having the price that you have and style of this like are those things that set you apart enough that kind of like somebody that makes an eighty five dollar mug do you feel like you're in that space for jewelry or a hundred dollar um, mug I don't know I I feel like I feel like you said that question and I don't actually know what you just said. Do you feel the 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 characteristics of your jewelry because it's I don't know the market for jewelry, but I would guess forty five dollars a pair is not the median price or an average price of what people typically pay for jewelry well like that's that. my that's my high price i would say that 30 to 35 is the median price for sure unless you're going to target for 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 any types of jewelry or is that is that like clay jewelry or just like that design where it's like resin or polymer clay or whatever like any any higher end type not even higher end but like good quality type jewelry is going to be 30 to 35 to 40, you know? Okay. So the 40, but the $45 pairs that you have, those are the high end of your options. You also have some mm-hmm. that are 30 or 35. Some that are 38 and some that are 28. So 28. Yeah. So tw- or you're breaking up so bad right now. It's probably my freaking internet here. Yeah, I might turn the camera off. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm okay. going to make Do sure. Do you want me to turn off. my camera off? Uh, it's probably because we're, cause we're streaming it or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's I think it's it's definitely a challenge because, like you said, your your customers online are already pottery people. They're not jewelry people, or they don't know you from jewelry, or they've come right. Maybe they've 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 come along the way along the way, but that's not the right. initial yeah initial thing. Right. So, How is the pinch pots? Did you did you make the pinch pots and sell those yet? I've made the pinch pots. I've been waiting for the ones in the red clay to come out because I think that's going to be the clay that I'm going to use um, more. So I want to put those on Etsy, but I wanted to wait till the red clay came out. Right now I just have black clay. So um, 
yeah, they're all out. They're all in that room right there. I just have to go get them. And, uh, but I only sold one pinch pot the last market, so I don't know. They're a good price, though. They're $12 or three for 30 So Okay. I feel like they'd be good on Etsy. I but, do, too. I mean, that's it'll, why I it'll take some time. Etsy. Yeah, that's why I want to put them on time. Etsy. Um, so eventually I will, but I mean, not eventually like this week I will. I just had to get the color options, uh, out of the kiln, you know, community. Did you figure kilns. out how you're going to, how are you going to list them? Are you going to do them individually by color or are you going to do a mix and match like artist choice or are, are you, are you going to do color schemes, like pick a color type or something? So it's I like only have eight colors. Warm tones or cool or. I only okay. have eight. So you're going to list all the so, colors? Yeah, I think I'm just going to list the colors. Yeah. So that should be good. Um, yeah, I think they'll I think they'll be good. They just got to – it'll just take some time. So are you going to be doing right. it for the long term and keep them, keep them live, or are you going to do them until you sell out and then they'll, they'll be gone? I'm going to try. I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm going to try. But yeah, the, so uh, the clay body is going to be tough though, right? Because of the where you're physically located. Because if that's aardvark clay, you're not going to have. It's Laguna. I Wait, see boxes. Is it Laguna? It's called Terra Red, but it's very similar to Mahalan. So I thought you said the red one was. Okay, because you said the aardvark remember. is a terracotta red or something, right? Yeah, I don't remember. Or Terra, Terra but, Red or something like that. Yeah, Terra Red. So, yeah, so we'll see. I'm, you know, I'm still just, I got this, my friend helped me with this website. Oh, I was going to tell you about this. Uh, my friend helped me with this website that uh, is called Marmalade. 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 It's M A R. What is that? A L E A D and it's specifically for Etsy and you put in your Etsy and then they go through your listings and they grade your listings. So they say like, this is an A plus, this is a B, this is a D, this is a C. And um, they tell you why, and then they tell you how you can change it. And uh, hmm. I'm really excited to kind of like, I've been tweaking one listing to see how I can get it up to like an A right now. It's at a B minus everything else is a C plus. So, um, and then I'm going to kind of judge like, stuff like the photos. Do they judge that or do they just judge the text? They judge like how many photos you have and, um, like what your, what your, um, in, like description is. And they have like AI that can help you with this, the description and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, is that a paid service or do they offer X amount of listings yeah, free it's, or it's something? Paid. So you have to pay. So, anyway, Marmalade, Marmalade. It's like a monthly subscription or you can do the yearly, but I have been kind of like working with it and I'm hoping that it helps. So, um, I'm determined to make my Etsy okay. Um, yeah. The, th- the one thing that I was like, and I don't know if it was the brightness on my screen or something, but I think it's like the, the earrings are dark for, in my opinion, when I look at your listings yeah. and I don't know why I, I, I think it's the, the background is bright and it's like contrasting and it's not like the, the ceramics is hard to, to see like brightness. Yeah. Wise. Well, and we always keep our screens like a lot less bright than, you know, I don't know. I'll I'll probably change the photos a little bit, but I have like different photos in there. But yeah, so I'll work with the photos and I'll yeah. work with everything. Yeah. Mhm. Okay. <sighs> oh, we got an Antica next week. It's coming up. Uh, next next week? Not next week. Two weeks from now. Yeah. It is coming up. I have an order that I have a mug club order that I'm doing right now that has to be done before we leave for Enzika. And I'm trying to decide if I should pack it all in a suitcase and bring it out there or if I should just 
ship it. I'm probably going to just ship it. How many is it? 30. Hmm. Yeah. What did you do for glaze option? Because you're at the studio. Did you just get some commercial glaze or just use their, you just sent I'm them just some sample use colors? Their glazes. No, she doesn't care what colors they are. She's just like, just make them shiny on the inside. That's all I care about. So um, oh. I'm just going to do whatever I want. She's a pretty okay. easy customer, which is great. Yeah. Are they I, were they stamps or what are they on the outside? They're badges. They're badges. Yeah. And so I'm just gonna. And the way I did it last time was I just dipped the whole mug, and then just wiped off over the stamp, and it worked out great. <laughs> oh, okay. And, That's good. Yeah, and she's just really easy. And I already showed her the, like the shape of the mug is just a, the handles a smidge different, and she loves it. And so, um, yeah, she's a good she's a good customer. So yeah, I'm, that's I'm, good when I'm they're they're flexible. <laughs> yeah, she's like, all I care is that they're the right size and that they're shiny on the inside. I'm like, great. <laughs> we'll see if what we can do. I still don't know. I was like, I don't know for sure if it's going to be the right size because it's always a gamble. But um, in my opinion, even if you measure it 15 times, sometimes pottery's like, fuck you. And um, and so. I was like, I don't know if it's going to be the right size, but I'm, I think it will be. And she goes, well, the ones you did earlier were perfect. And I was like, yeah, really shot myself in the foot on that one. Like, yeah, really C's do get degrees. And uh, you should never give your A-plus work a meet, like at, at first, you know, first meeting. Never. Uh, I don't know. Don't give them C. Don't give them C work. I mean, maybe the maybe the work I'm, can be C, but the service a I think should be A. I think the, oh, the service needs to be A regardless. I think A minus work is perfect on first, and then you can go up from there. But man, I had to make them exactly the right size. Like, come on. Uh huh. <sighs> I think so. like I think like A plus work and C, like business side of it, like follow through and timing and all that stuff. like i think that could lose you a customer but if you get like mm -hmm. c work but like a customer service i think you could keep that customer i think you're I more agree. likely to keep a customer because you have room obviously, to go up yeah obviously you want to be in the b plus a range of both already but yeah okay well she seems like a good uh option for you yeah considering you're not a mug maker but you're willing to for her so sure she's happy yeah. about that yeah <laughs> she doesn't know how blessed she is to be my customer <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> martha i don't do this for anyone else <laughs> um yeah. okay shall we move on to we're not going to do a question today we're going to do a what would you do if yeah so this actually recently happened to me so Ooh. uh what would you do if your kiln errors around cone three or four when it's supposed to get to cone six? Some pieces or glazes look okay, but others look off. I would re-fire them. Just re-fire the whole thing? Yeah. I mean, like, I would fix the kiln and then re-fire them. Okay. What would you do? What did you so, do? What did you do? So I I unloaded pieces into my other kiln and fired the other kiln. Um, mm -hmm. The risk was that there were some pieces that have some that had some glaze movement already, and mm -hmm. they moved a lot more and onto the shelf. So I lost a number of pieces from glaze. On what this. did you I mean, fire it to the second time? Cone six, the same same firing cycle. I would have fired a cone five instead of six. Yeah. So, and then I don't know if this was because of, of the previous firing, um, or something else, but a, a handful of them had a lot of pinholes in them too. So. Uh. So I don't know if there were so. It's it's like some of the colors were like. It wasn't matte. Like, it wasn't clearly under-fired. It was glassy, but it wasn't mm -hmm. the, the color saturation and, like, effects and 
movement and stuff like that was off. It it just looks stale. Yeah. Like some of the colors kind of blend and drip and run and stuff. So, um, but I guess the the main risk is if you just keep it, you know, some of those pieces are going to be under fired and not vitrified and like, mm-hmm. like the color might look okay, but like not ideal. So a handful of them I just kept and set aside, like the, there's some shot glasses that I just, um, took out and kept because I was like, okay, if I refire these, these are definitely going to run onto the shelf, just like the mugs that I was talking about. Yeah. So I was fine with the shot glasses because they were kind of like just tests and they're small. So I'm not worried about those too much, but, um, mugs, bowls, stuff like that. Yeah. I lost, it, it was more of this one glaze combo because I completely cover the pot twice with two different glazes to get the color I'm looking for. Yeah. So it, I was like, oh, this thing is going to run like crazy. So, yeah, I didn't think of going to Cone 5, but that's probably a good option, too. Like yeah, I think Cone I 5, no cone hold, or Cone 5 with, like, a... Because normally I go to... Actually, normally I do go to Cone 5, but I hold for, like, in the kiln that's newer, that's got brand new elements. Usually, like, 10-minute hold at Cone 5, and it gets to Cone 6. And then the other one I do cone five hold 18 minutes okay because that one's getting near the end of its element life uh i think i just replace the elements (laughs) so um so yeah i still got a few pieces on the bottom shelf and i'm like and some of it you can tell like the the speckled clay body you can definitely tell it's it's not like um it's kind of like if you get toast out of the out of the um toaster and it's like there's no color to it. Yeah. It's just kind of like pale. And that's kind of what the clay looked like. And I'm like, ah, this isn't fired enough. Like it needs to go hotter. So. Yeah. And even if like the glazes seem like they're, they're pretty um, firm and they're, they're not moving. When I tend to refire pieces, I notice that the glaze like runs a lot more and I can see like on the speckle clay, the specks like run with, the glaze more when I refire it than prior. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would definitely fire it. Yeah. Uh, I would probably do five, no hold in the new kiln and see how they come out. Yeah. Some of that, I guess is just salvaging and, you know, you know, risk it or not risk. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, all right. That's why you make a lot of pieces in case shit like that happens. Seriously. Um, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't too much of a loss. It was just kind of like an extra kiln. And I was like, oh, shit, it aired. But, eh. Yep. It is it what it is what it is. Okay. Speaking of kilns. Uh, that was my L&L. So I will be replacing the elements. I have done that before, but uh, I might need to investigate some other stuff because I got I got a specific error code. Um, it was in my booklet talking about the error code and what it could mean. It could mean like the elements are out. It could mean a relay's out. It could mean you know the thermocouple was reading off or something like that. So uh, I got some investigating to do. I might look on the website to see if there are some ways to go through that troubleshooting. But because like the relay, I was like, how do you know if a relay is going out or not? Right. Um, and then like the, the thermocouples, I can easily check those. Just, you know, unscrew it, pull them out, look at them, see if they need. But uh, the element slumping and stuff like that, I'm like, eh, maybe that'll be enough. But uh but we'll see. I, I think it should be pretty easy to, to fix. Um, yeah, and when you put those elements in, I don't know if they say this on their website, but it's nice if you, like, stretch them out just a bit, and then they just sit right on in there. Yeah, um, you still have to do that a little bit, so they'll... Yeah. Otherwise, uh, I'm kind of fiddling with it, and they fall out, and 
I just changed out the elements in two kilns, uh, not made from L and L. It rhymes with butt, and um, <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> the it was awful. First of all, the amount of pins that you have to put in is unrealistic to life. It was like I was talking to Sheboygan Andrew, and I was like, Ugh, "These fucking pins," and he was like, "Just poke your eyeballs out with them. That's all you can do with them." And um, <laughs> second of all, the elements are so goddamn thick, and they're like, I personally have carpal tunnel, so it's really hard for me to like squeeze things, and so uh, you have to cut the elements, which is with every kiln, but then you have to crimp the fucking wires together, and it's awful. Um, oh yeah, the crimping is tough. Crimping is balls. Like, we have a lot different, better technology, guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. And you can't you can't leave the pens out, right? Like, you can, you can, the elements can be, like, stretched and, like, put in there, but they won't settle in without pens. Or, or is that in case, so they don't pop out before I think they if get you fired? Stretched them, I think if you stretched them, it would potentially relieve the pin situation for the most part. But that doesn't change the fact that you have to take out 15 bajillion pins the first time you ever change out the elements. Mm-hmm. Like, and there's ones that are hidden, you know? There's like... <laughs> and every time I pull the element elements out of the those kilns, um, or the Olympic that I've had before... Um, it always feels like it's shaving a bunch of the kiln brick out. When oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm like, wait, is it that tough to put them in initially? Are they shaving kiln brick down when I'm putting them in? I don't remember, but yeah, when I'm pulling like, them out, I feel like I'm I'm grinding away a bunch of brick. I currently have a kiln that, sent, that rhymes with fart, and I... <laughs> When I changed out the elements for the first time, I was Bo- cringing the whole time. Bone. Because it rhymes with bone fart. It rhymes with bone fart. And um, and I was <laughs> cringing the whole time just because like, of how, many, how much kiln brick I took out. Now, putting the elements in it was a breeze, but taking them out was awful. And they kept on breaking because they were really fragile. And it was so like snug in there which i mean is great because you don't need pins but like i i Mm -hmm. I, like every six inches it would break and i was like oh my fucking goodness so anyway that's why you should buy an l and l (laughs) (laughs) this is real talk right here guys real fucking talk yes Uh, and if you want to look at the kilns that are available or you need to troubleshoot your kiln you can go to Hotkill.com. Yes. Yep. Okay. And, and you know what? I will end this with one great thing. You know what's one of the best things about LNL kilns is that you don't have to figure out if it's a cone 10 kiln or a cone 6 kiln or a cone 8 kiln. It is always a fucking cone 10 kiln. And that is a great fucking thing. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Just had to throw that in there. I just have to throw that in there. <laughs> yep. So, what are we going to talk about today, Ryan? By the way, we're trying to make this a short-ish issue uh, episode because I want to make some food, and Ryan has a show tomorrow, so... Yeah, I want to chill out a little bit. Yeah. Okay, and I already so... poured peach rum. No, it was peach whiskey in a thing of Mountain Dew, and I'm almost done with it, so... That doesn't sound good. Peach actually, and Mountain Dew. It was like a raspberry flavored Mountain Dew, and it's actually quite delicious. Hmm. Do people yeah. his Do people typically use Mountain Dew as a mixer for? I don't think so. I just had it. <laughs> <laughs> it was so I'm trying to think of something raspberry adjacent, want, like as well. It's like it's know. called Voltage or something, Volts or something like that. And it was a bottle that somebody bought that did, they didn't want and then they gave me and and hmm. so put peach whiskey in it. Yeah, it sounds like you were making the M- Mountain Dew tolerable, honestly. I I wonder if there's a reason why they gave it to you, but No, actually the Mountain Dew is pretty good. 
I just have had a lot of Mountain Dew recently, and I've we've had a week, man. It's been a fucking week. I don't know if it's been a week over there, but it's been a week over here. So it's been all right. I mean, it's been yeah, raining it's a so lot, but gross. Nothing too crazy, I don't think. What are we talking about today? Okay, so this actually came up. Uh, Zipporah asked about this. Oh. So she had this topic idea. It was um, asking how did the podcast start and how did we manage it early on and plan ahead for what we were going to talk about and then where we are now with it, how do we feel about it, and then if there are any, like, long-term plans for it and opportunities we see for it in the future. We're going to sell it for $1 million. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so we should start with the fact that we started the podcast in August of 2018. 19. 19. Was it 19? I don't know. I'm going to scroll back on our... <laughs> Look at us. We don't even know. I, yeah, I didn't come prepared. Uh, I think it's 19. No, wait. That's when I got Lloyd. It's 18. The scrolling. podcast is one year older than Lloyd, I think. So, um, while he's scrolling, I'll let you know how we mm, kind of... Like, I think you're wrong. Is it 19? August of 2019. Okay, 2019. Actually, I was right the first time. Yeah. The second time. One of the times. Anyway, um, so uh-huh. at the time, uh, Instagram had just come up with Instagram Live, and we would do lives and like the ones where you could actually like be on Instagram Live with another person, and we were friends. We'd met once. <laughs> at the Enseca in Minneapolis and you know there was a lot of times where we would just get on lives and just chat and talk about pottery stuff and just kind of shoot the shit and at some point I think both of us probably at the same time kind of were just like why are we doing this we should just do a podcast Mm -hmm. and um, so we did And it was really that kind of simple. We, I think I researched what type of, like we, obviously we were friends, so, and we have Ryan Durbin, so um, we doled out things to do. And, (laughs) and like I researched plans and to do lists and stuff. Yeah. And like we had a whole list of like what, names would be good like we had a whole note and um i searched like the the um what's the page called like buzzsprout what is about buzzsprout like hosting a hosting website like well quite literally i just like did a google search and i was like ryan i think we should use this one he was like okay <laughs> well yeah i think i think we were kind of i mean i i probably googled something similar like top host podcast hosting platforms and then you kind of go through okay what's the price structure how does it do it does it do it based on time uploaded does it do it based on just a flat monthly fee is it you know uh most of the benefits of the hosting is that it takes all of the um distribution part of it and actually sending it out to all the rss feeds and whatnot for you so you don't have to go to spotify and put it on there you don't have to go to apple and Right. Podbean and all those other ones and figure out how to get it on there. You just kind of do it and then it'll distribute to the different sources um, over time. And uh, it makes it pretty easy. So, yeah, there's a few out there. And then we were kind of looking into, okay, how do we record it? Like, you know, do we use um, do we do we pay for something like a Zoom or a um I mean, Skype has been around forever, so that's what we use for just talking to one another. Yeah, and this was, like, before Zoom got big, you know? Yeah, Zoom was probably a thing at that point, but it wasn't wasn't as well known as it was once COVID hit. um, Which wasn't that long after we started, but 
but yeah, we were kind of going for low stress, low cost. Yep. Um, just to not overexert ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, because figuring out like what we're going to talk about and just doing it consistently was the focus early on, I think. And yeah. uh, we, pro- we probably had to put a little more effort into figuring out what we were going to talk about. And Yeah, we had like planning. a list. I remember we had like a list of topics mm-hmm. to talk about. And then we would... I'm not really a planner. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And Ryan is. So I think that's probably where we kind of like collided the most, I would say. You know? Collided? Collided. That's how we collided the most. What do you mean? Like like back and forth? Like headbutted? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Oh, that's what I meant. Headbutted. Yeah. Headbutted okay. the most. But I mean, like, we really don't headbutt that much. But... I would say yeah. that would be the the one part of the of the whole situation that was like, uh, what do you want to talk about today? You know, and we'd we'd maybe like send a text like two days earlier and kind of like decide. And I remember when we got interviewed by Paul Blaze, and he was like, "How do you guys still have like topics to talk about?" And we were like, "We don't know." What the heck is going on here? What? My freaking garage band is fucking up. That's okay. We'll just use the Skype. Okay. That's good. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. And what's your, what are, I, I, I guess... We kind of like went into separate roles pretty easily. What's your your role is what? Um yeah, I I mean I'm I'm always thinking of ideas of what I think would be interesting for an audience to yeah. hear, hear about like like I don't I don't want it to sound like cocky or something, but it's like I feel like it's It does take skill to like figure out what you think would be, even though her and I like know what we're talking about, about a certain topic and we know what one another would probably, we could probably answer for one another for a lot of these topics. Um, And the um, keeping in mind that you're doing this for a reason, like her and I are doing it together to talk about something that, either we care about deeply or we care a little bit about, or we think it's worth like sharing insight on and it's, it's valuable to a wider audience of people, no matter what skill set you're at, um, or level of skill or experience or whatever. Um, and it's like, you know, where could you hear about these very specific topics? Right. You You know, sometimes it's like, okay, you could go to, a to some kind of a course or something that goes through the A, B, C, D of social media marketing or something. But I feel like sharing it from a firsthand experience of like how each of us do it and that we're different enough that we can um, relate to pe- to different groups of people because we're so different personally. Yeah. Um, and it provides a good way for us to just like, you know, mix it up and also come up with, okay, well, you think about it that way, but like, I think about it completely different. So I might relate right. more to these other people or these questions might come up because I've run into this myself or, or I think ahead and I always ask questions all the time. So like, I'm just naturally curious and someone that's going to ask those follow-up questions and more and more of them so that I can kind of dig deeper into a topic. And, uh, and then a lot of times I feel like I'm interviewing you about a lot of this stuff just to like get your sense of what you think about it. And then I can also share my input of like what I, how I think through it. Um, Yeah. I think that 
not to interrupt, but I'm interrupting. Um, I think that that's your strength. Like your biggest strength is that you are a phenomenal interviewer and like, you're naturally a very curious person. Like you want to know all of the details and I could care less about a lot of that stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And so like, that's, I think that's how we have been able to work so well together is just because of that. Like if it was me, we all know this, but if it was up to me, I would have a shoot the shit episode every single week. We just talk about random crap. And like the fact that (laughs) Ryan, Ryan is structured enough to be like, no, I want to talk about this. Like, this is interesting. Like that's, what's really kept this going for such a long time. Um, I edit it. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) That's my job. You edit it. I, but I think, I don't know how to quantify, but I, I, I would say that you are a lot of the personality of the podcast, honestly, because even though like I ask a lot of questions or at, like talk a lot of it, even if there's an interviewee or whoever, like you're adding a lot of personality to it that yeah. is not coming from me. So like where you're saying well, yeah. like, oh, I don't, I couldn't care less about these things or you know, I don't really have a deep, a deep understanding or like, I don't care to think, you know, three and four questions deep on some of these topics because it it should be simple or you can think of it in simple terms and just be like, you know what, just start here. And like, you know, that should be your focus because some people can, can tend to, you know, paralysis by analysis and you, you just go so deep into it that you're, you kind of like you're frozen and you can't really make strides in a positive direction. So, yeah, I've always said that I'm the Jar Jar Binks to your Obi Wan Kenobi. Um, I'm like the comedy relief, but not to be confused with my intelligence. I am very smart. Um, <laughs> but some would say that Jar Jar Binks was actually extremely intelligent in that movie. Anyway, you wouldn't know uh, because you don't. Haven't watched Star Wars. Anyway, moving nope. on. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, like, Ryan's kind of, like, the brains of the operation as opposed to me, who is, like, I make sure it's edited. Um, I make sure it's uploaded on time. He listens to it to make sure it's not awful. And then we just, like, upload it. And I think that, I mean, I don't know when we decided this, but we very clearly decided that it would be a very simple edit, like front, back, nothing in the middle. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I think from my perspective, I know that I don't want to add additional stress on you for, for like, I know that I could request that of you, but I know that you're not going to enjoy doing it. So for that sake, I'm like, you know what? You can have it. Like, just, just keep it simple. Yeah, and I do what we've always done. Like, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here and do something completely. Like, we don't have to reinvent our podcast every year and change something up drastically. We can keep it the same, and I think the content will speak for itself. Like us talking about the the topics and whatever you know segments we do, um, add a little bit of different flavor to it that helps set us apart as wheel talk, but also just lets our personality show through as we go for sure yeah and like i and like the reason that we decided to make it simple is just because we didn't want it to be so much work on us at the time in like 2019 i was working so much you know and um and you were working a lot too and we just didn't want it to be something that we hated you know like you can and i feel like we've pretty much successfully done that i mean i don't hate it sometimes yeah, i don't I'm annoyed either. at it but like sometimes i'm like god we have to record <laughs> yeah i mean i mean when that's the that's the only when that's the only thing you need to have it happen like yeah i mean you do have to have to edit it and get get it up and write the descriptions but but in relation to like the whole work involved it's just setting aside time to record for two hours a week. Right, exactly. Or stack and, it up yeah. so you don't have to record every week. But 
It's like, yeah. you know, when that's all you got to worry about, it's not like, oh, we've got to record. We've got to create segment. We got to cut segments out. We've got to create Instagram reels. We've got to create, you know, carousels of, you know, advertising yeah. the podcast and getting people to co- entice them to come listen to it. It's like when we don't have to do all that other stuff or the YouTube or whatever. Right. It just removes that like noise, in my opinion, that takes away from. Like, I get it. We could reach more people by doing all of that, but what's the cost to it? Right. Because really, at the end of the day, this was for us. It wasn't for anybody else. You know, it's like, it's us talking about things that we genuinely enjoy talking about. So, so we would probably still be doing this even if we didn't record it. Because whether that be us chit-chatting on the phone or like having a a video call, you know, like we're going to do this regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like on the weeks that we don't have a podcast, I always call you and we like talk for three hours. <laughs> I feel like we haven't done that. Re- we did that really pretty recently, but before yeah. that we haven't for a while, but we also record yeah. pretty much every week. Yeah. So and oh and i should point out that it takes me 10 minutes to edit the the podcast like this is not a <laughs> sit down and, and spend yeah this is not hours. a high maintenance effort but at the very beginning i did listen to the entire episode over and over like i not over and over but i would i would like go to a coffee shop and listen to the entire episode to make sure that everything was all right and it took me probably two months to realize that i didn't need to do that and um yeah, and so I was working really hard at the beginning, and once I kind of realized that, I was like, oh, I guess this is fine. It's good to yeah, go. Yeah, I think you kind of figure out the way to do it, and you just rinse and repeat. You don't have to right. You don't have to overthink it. But some of the stuff that, like, like frustrating me right now is, like, I'm not in the posi- I'm not in the same spot. So like I've got a different microphone, I've got a different room I'm in. It's like right. echoey. I've got the laptop that's on Wi-Fi that's not good enough, so I can't see or I can see you, but I, you can't see me. And my audio just did something weird. I'm using a different like, like differences like that, or like when you forget your headphones and we've got to like audible. I'm like, oh, we need to just just do the exact same thing. I know it's like, oh, we got to go out and get this headphones or go out and get the mic or what. And yeah. it's like just getting all of that narrowed into just rinse and repeat and use the same technology, like removes yeah. a lot of those extra just issues that could come up. So For once sure. you settle into something that works, it's like, OK, just keep going with it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I should also mention that we use GarageBand. So, um, we have a, we have a, what is, it's kind of like a two factor authentication system, but not really. Um, (laughs) we have a backup. So we use Skype, we record on Skype and that's the reason we do Skype is because you can record for free. So we record on Skype and then we also sync our garage band. So like at 7:40 and 40 seconds, we will press go on both of our garage bands and he'll he'll put the garage band into the drive and i'll take that and i've done the like intro and the outro and uh i'll put it all together uh if that doesn't work we always have skype as a backup which we're going to use today because my garage band flipped out yeah and so that's uh so i mean like that's really nice to have you know and typically the the technology works. Something happened with, I opened my phone and it connected to audio on my phone instead of the mic for some reason. Again, different laptop. It wouldn't have happened if I was on my other computer because I use my phone all the time. Right. But it's like things can come up and having backups and not having to like re-record the whole thing um, makes it easier. But also the, you know, the, I think there were... Did you have any thought of it? I mean, we naturally had to do this separately because we weren't physically located in the same spot. But um, I actually think it helps being in two different spots. I agree. I think whenever we do it together, because... it's just awful. <laughs> it's not awful, but it's just like not the same. 
I think it's for me, it's because you're already like we're already doing stuff together and we're already around one another. So setting aside time when you're physically in the same space to be like, okay, we're going to go record a podcast now. And you feel like you have to be like, quote unquote, like on because the the mic is on and you've got to be like in that mode. I feel like having it interrupt my not interrupt, but having it set aside during my week to like, okay, we're going to record at this time. It kind of gets me in the mode of, okay, I'm going to be at my computer. I know that I'm, I'm doing this in a way that it's, it's, you know, with the microphone rather than yeah. trying to sit down naturally with a microphone between us and do it. It's, it's just, God, I can't even I imagine having to like drive to your house every day, get everything set up, do all the things and then go home. Like, it's so nice to be able to just be wherever I am and mm-hmm. just get on the computer and do it that way. Like I can't imagine doing it in person every time. I think it would be – it wouldn't work for us at all. Yeah. I mean, that would be a lot of – that would be a big commitment, plus shit can happen. I mean, you could get into an accident on the way there or, you, like, the yeah. weather can be shit or, you know, you're like, oh, shit, I forgot about it. I got to drive over, so I'll be there in 45 yeah. minutes or whatever. It's like – Like, the amount of times that we push back the time or we change it to a different day. Like, yesterday, I – forgot about it and uh and i was like can we do this tomorrow and he was like yeah it actually works better and like we couldn't do that if we met and did the recording yeah it'd be a lot more limiting yeah but yeah i would say if you're if somebody's out there thinking about it like you got to start somewhere and just be you got to be like okay with okay it's it's going to be kind of shitty to start out but you you're kind of learning that skill over time where, yeah, you know, like we, um, we've kind of, we've, we've grown with the ability to chat for 10 minutes beforehand and be like, okay, what are we going to talk about today? And we have a list of things that we could talk about from the note that we share, but it's not like I'm thinking about this for, the whole day before or three hours before and I've got to like write notes and come up with ideas. It's just like when you do this consistently with one another, you can kind of figure out what, how to gel together and how it works and what's, and also like, you know, whether you need, like, do you need a set amount of time that you want it to be? Or do you just, you know, like the segments and stuff like coming up with segments is like, OK, that'll probably be like 10 minutes or something. But it's not so structured that it's like, OK, we got to do this and that'll be 10 minutes. This will be, you know, we do the ad for two minutes and then we do this talk right. and this talk's got to be an hour or an hour and a half or like like we don't have any restrictions or limits on that stuff. So it just kind of like we do have a schedule, flows. but we do have a schedule like it, it took us probably it took us not that long to kind of figure out that we like jab at the beginning, like we kind of just shoot the shit. For 15, well, we we started out for like 15 minutes, and now it's like more like 30. Um, but Sometimes we, it's been at, an hour, but <laughs> yeah, at I think one we've point, reeled like, it back we in. We really have to. That's recently. Yeah, we were like, we really have to like keep it down to 20. <laughs> but yeah, we like shoot the shit, and then we do a question, and then we probably do the the um. The ad, and then we get into the main topic, and that's just the way it works. And and I'm sure, I mean, it's just like every other sitcom or every other, you know, anything. There, there's a routine that happens, and it's just a natural kind of progression. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the Some, se- like the se- the segments have changed a little bit over time too. And those are just yeah. I don't know where we came up with some of those. I mean, the listener question obviously is, hey, you know, people send us questions, so why not answer them publicly for people yeah. to hear? Because I'm sure if somebody's asking it, somebody else is thinking the same thing. So for sure. Um. So that's always been there. The what would you do if it was just kind of fun? Uh, mm-hmm. that kind of ebbs and flows here and there. And then the, you know, the live Q&A was like an extension of listener question, but yeah. it's just kind of, hey, we can talk to some people for a longer period of time and just kind of ask them more follow-up questions that will give them a more contextual answer that actually is more useful than just they send us text and then we interpret as much as we can from it. 
yeah and answer it as best we can but if it's if it's like oh well this thing is a blind spot for me like that thing that you suggested doesn't work because of x so you know we can we can talk through it so yeah well and and also i think like i mean we haven't really even talked about like how we do interviews and stuff like that but i think everybody that has been with us for a while realizes that we mostly only do interviews with people that we are familiar with at least a little bit so that we can have i would say a lot a, like a decent amount i wouldn't even say a yeah. little bit i would say a lot or some like i've been following most of these people for years i would years, say years years um, yeah because like there could be requests for certain people to interview and i'm like oh i don't even know that person so then you gotta you know it's like you gotta get acquainted you gotta figure out what they're about like what they make how they kind of talk about their work or what i always talk about it from like if i were if there was an idea for somebody to interview i would have to have in like an angle of like something that i think that they have that's unique or something that they can talk about to a to a depth that would benefit a good amount of people that is not the same as what person Y has Mm -hmm. the same thing to talk about so it's not that it's like cut and paste from person a to person b but it's like hey I, i feel like they have a good sense of business about wholesale or right you know doing commissions or pricing or whatever and then you kind of go down that route and it's like okay that's like that doesn't have to be the thread through the whole conversation but that's like a good a good um like a big rock that you can like plant in the conversation as something to to kind of branch off of so yeah so that's usually the the way i think about it for people that we're going to talk to and ryan usually finds the people we talk to um that's his job because he's a lot more i'm social on the internet but i'm not as social with like other potters in the same way ryan is uh we have only ever had one person that we interviewed that we didn't really know and Mm -hmm. it did not go well no that's two people actually i would say it Uh, did go well it's just it's just tougher it's tougher to just tougher it's tougher to yeah. because that could be like somebody asking to be on. You know, if you ask to be on and we don't really know you, it's tough. Like you can't just like assuming that we're just conversating with people all the time and it's like, okay, we can get two hours out of this. But if I'm like, even if it's somebody that I do know about on Instagram or whatever, mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't even know what I would talk to them for an hour for. What would, what would I right. ask them? That's not just boilerplate stuff because I don't I don't want to ask just boilerplate questions. I want to get into some topic deeper, and I can't right. I can't hope that those those topics and those ideas are just going to reveal themselves in the moment. I want to come prepared so that I can make it more enjoyable for a listener, so that it's not like oh that was kind of slow getting to that point, and then. When you get there, it's like, okay, well, they got, you know, 15, 20 minutes out of that. But then I feel like it's a challenge. Like I need to get, you know, when we interview someone, I would like to get at least an hour and a half or two hours out of it. Right. But, you know, and then I feel like, oh, if you're short of that, you know, is it somebody that wasn't as good of an interview because they expect it to be two hours? Whether it's the interviewee or the listener. So. Yeah. For sure. And I'm like, Ryan, can we please keep this under two hours? I got places to be. No. <laughs> I feel like you don't say that with interviewees, though, right? Mm, I've only done it once, I think. And that was recently. But um, but that was because you had uh, something to be somewhere to be or something. I but. literally did have somewhere to be. But yeah, um, no, I'm usually pretty good. I usually don't like we've said before, I don't really talk much during the interviews, um, which I'm perfectly content with. And, um, yeah, it's, and the way, the way that I like think about interview besides the, the angle thing I was talking about, I'm just like, you were talking about me being social. Like, I feel like 
and this isn't going to be a criticism of, of the work itself, but like, I think I'm more fascinated with the people and the right. potters themselves than the work that they produce. Yeah. And that's like, that's what gets me depth on Instagram. Yeah. And, and with these interviews and like, I'm learning so much about how to like adapt my business and my work and also, you know, having some of these conversations with different, different people that we interview and like, Hey, you know what? They, they really like care about this thing. And like, I haven't really thought of it that deeply and we wouldn't have, I wouldn't have those kind of inspiration moments or feelings like, okay, like, you know what, if I look at myself in my work, you know, I haven't really thought of it that way and like slow down to think about it, whether it's like talking to Tim C and talking about like really cheap items or, you know, low price right. items and how that fits into the larger scope of like your work and long term and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I think just understanding the people and some of the reasons behind why they do what they do or how they approach it or how they think about it. Um, and then it can also reveal like, oh, well, like I'm assuming they're thinking about this pretty deeply, but you know, in reality, they might not be thinking about it that deeply. They're just kind of winging it or, you know, I think that can, that can humanize a lot of people. They feel like, oh, well, this person's so in depth in thinking about this. This must be like, they must be planning it and going through all these, like taking notes and iterating and, and it's like, I mean, some people just do like what they post on social. It's like they just post what's fun in the moment. They're not, they're not like overthinking this and just planning weeks out at, at a time. And you know, it doesn't. You kind of get this image in your head of like what these people that are successful must be doing. But when you actually hear it from them, and they're like, "No, I don't take it that seriously." It's like, "Oh, okay. Right. Like maybe I'm overthinking this." Yeah, for sure. We should talk about money. Um, I mean, it's not very much, but we should talk about how we kind of like split things up. Um, we do make money from the podcast. You can't tell how much though. Yeah. Not, not very much, (laughs) but we we can't say how much I'm saying. We can't say how much from our contract with sponsors. Oh, I know. I know we're not going to say how much, but I'm saying it's not like a, a, a bunch or anything, but like we do make money and we split it 50, 50 and then take a little bit and just put it right back into the podcast for the very, for the first three years, we didn't make any money. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. And so we had the L and L sponsorship starting in February of 2023. Yeah. And a lot of like, I don't know if people don't listen to the podcast and they ask that they're like, Oh wait, you're sponsored. I didn't know that. And I don't know if they, and I wonder if it's like they listen here and there, but they don't notice and it doesn't come across like an ad because it's not like, and a word, quick word from our sponsor. Like we don't do it that way. So I think that's kind of the, the idea that it's not supposed to be so in your face. Um, so yeah, we, we started that in February and then we just signed, um, you know, the, the contract with L and L again for this year. And then also, um, speedball has been on board as well. So that's been, yeah, it's been great. It's been really good. I, and I think a lot of that is the L and L one started from them reaching out to us after listening, but, uh, the other, the speedball one and like other people that we've talked to is just like naturally wanting to, to be, I want to say in business, but like partnering and working with people of like products that we care about as well as just people that are kind and like people that we want them to also succeed. So, um, so I think that's kind of the approach we've took. It's not been, Oh, well like, let's get, let's see who we can get the money out of. It's like, you know, we could go elsewhere to get that kind of stuff if we wanted to. Um, you know, I think, and I think we've tried like the Buzzsprout ads here and there where it like threw in ads based on Buzzsprout's like options of, they had like a platform option where you could throw in ads and you can like pick certain ones that you thought, um, you would like to in- get injected and they would like put them in there for a period of time. I think we tried that before we got the LNL sponsorship and we would yeah. get like 50 cents at a time off of those <laughs> or, you know, it, it wasn't anything drastic. It was just like, okay, we're going to put it in there until it reaches X number of plays. And then the ad's going to go down. You're not going to have to do anything with it. 
And uh, so, like, that's the only other type of, you know, I want to say money that we've got that's been, like, outside of our, like, yeah. featured sponsors that are actually pottery related. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Super. It's, it's been a slow burn because we were very hesitant at first, but I'm glad we've done it. Did you feel like, did you feel early on or a year in or two years? Like, did you feel like a sponsor was inevitable or? No. I didn't know because like we were so set on not making this something that was like gonna like be, be work for us that I was like, I don't know if we're going to do sponsors or not, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think. I feel like it was kind of natural the way it evolved. Uh, I I feel like I wanted just a more formal sponsorship with some of these companies that I've already worked with. Yeah. Um, Whether it be like, you know, I've already done a lot of stuff with Speedball and, you know, Diamond Core over the years. Like, I've used a lot of Mudwork stuff and shouted them out. Um, But actually... Actually, like getting the the guts to to actually reach out, but I mean, yeah, from the L and L when they reached out to us, but um, actually feeling like we have something of value that we could quantify for a sponsor, and is it it's like the podcast sponsorship still feels like a newer thing for a lot of businesses, like. Yeah. Wait, especially in the ceramic space, like it's kind of like social media sponsorship for people, like paying for, you know, reels or, um, you know, getting beyond the trading product for acknowledgement and like mm-hmm. sponsor, like advertisement. Um, it still feels like a new frontier, sort of. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a, and I, I, th- I think we're probably a good. <laughs> We're probably a good um, example for others, like in the future, that oh well, like these companies are willing to do this. Like, okay, well, you know, maybe some other companies are thinking, oh well, you know, like they they advertise on podcasts, like you know, we advertise in Ceramics Monthly or whatever. You know, how is po- like our podcast actually reaching a lot of people? You know, what's the pros right. and cons? How much is that worth for us? You know, it lives forever, so. Um, you know, it, it could be a longer lasting thing that's not just delivered to your doorstep on a specific month and day and you look for it, you look through it and you might stop by the the ad for, you know, 30 seconds and you probably flip past it in a magazine. But, you know, what's the impact of something that people are actually going to hear from the people that are hosting and they actually know, you know? Yeah. It's so helpful to ha- also have sponsors that you actually like the products and use the products, you know. Um, it's so natural and easy. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you think long term um, or and it doesn't have to be long, long term, but like going like maybe a year from now or uh you know, what would be like a next step that you could see realistically happening or progression looking like? God, I don't even know. It's like, man, I don't know. Like, it's such a, I almost feel like it's so taboo to kind of like think of that because it's the two of us. So it's, it's more of like a team thing and it just like kind of happens naturally um, I mean, eventually it's got to end, right? Does it have to end? Does it? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we'll see, like, when you become full-time and we'll kind of, like, see what that entails. But I would love to get to a point where it makes us enough money that it's, like, an actual, like, substantial amount every month for us. Um. I would love yeah, to get I, to that point. I think that's totally doable. I and I think the I think the steps that we're taking and the 
it's one of those things where like you haven't written a podcast con you haven't written a, a sponsorship contract before and it's like okay we got that on the books like we did that and then it's right. like okay well we haven't written a second one okay we did that with a new sponsor we got a new sponsor this is what yeah. we got here's what the offer was here's what we agreed on like okay and then it's like and then we renewed it so it's giving us confidence in like building blocks to feel like okay you know what even if you know we can't foresee where it's going to be a year from now um yeah it's like we've proven that we can you know get an option on the table or an opportunity and then yeah like seize it and take advantage of it and it like works but it doesn't like change the the like heart of the podcast and the relationship and stuff like that um yeah you know there's probably a little more pressure that okay we have sponsors now so we can't just we can't just sail it sail it in and just not record for three months or something like that like right like there is an expectation that we have to show up for that um but like i don't see it as being unrealistic and i would see it's difficult with because the podcast is not physically located anywhere it's people are Mm -hmm. widespread where they're listening but i would love to get to a point where there would be an opportunity on the table that someone would invite us to physically present and like i want to say do like a workshop or a demo but i would i would love to have people like invite us to be presentation or presenting not at like a conference but like at a studio or something like that Mm. um that were like sought out for our expertise of certain things or or being invited as part of whether it is a conference or not or you know being invited to be on a panel or something but it's not it's not like we are the driver of the i don't know i mean i guess we would be producing whatever content we're presenting on but like i would love to be invited to say we'd like to have you for your insight about running a podcast about small business and pottery or something like that where it's like a panel of different people and we're asked different questions or whatever um or it's like hey we're seeking you out not just for your for your um for your knowledge of what you already share on the podcast but like you know we'd like to see you physically and like have you um actually interact and and like talk with people in person at one of these things versus like okay we've done the presentations at click on west where we're basically doing a live podcast people can hear in the room and they can also hear after the fact when we publish it but like actually being able to reach people and talk with them back and forth about whatever i think that would be cool to do and have the opportunity to do um but i'm like what is the physical reach that we have in a specific city like obviously i would say like cincinnati but you know if, if we if like queen city clay wanted to have us do something like how many people would actually show up? That would be my like. Right. Well, Clay is such a niche group, you know. It's so hard to like let that, you know. It's it, that's just hard to to prove or to even quantify, you know. Yeah. I mean, I feel like in a way it could. We could. I mean, we could do something like this on our own with. Um, like having a get together at an Encica, which we've done in the past with like kind of pot swap related. Um, and also, la- I mean, last year we did it at the brewery and stuff, but um, like if it were, and I feel like pot swap is a unique thing as well that, you know, we could get people, we could be the the person that organizes to get people to come together that may have just interacted virtually and then you get them in the same place and say, Hey, we're going to do a meetup. And it's like, you know, or is there a, you know, is there like a wheel talk? I don't want to say like a wheel. (laughs) 
I'm kind of relating it to like um, Sarah Anderson's like Scrafito tour. Like, is there a Wheel Talk tour or something where we like go to different right. studios and and like it could be in different spots where you could get, you know, what is what is our reach that we could actually have something like that be valuable for people to come to? Um, you know, what would they get differently from that experience than uh, listening? You know, it, it's more it's more one sided when they're just listening in their studio, I guess. But, you know, how could we make it different that it would be a back and forth with with people in person? You know, I don't know. Yeah. Who knows, man? Who freaking knows? I, and I think it could totally get to the financial side of it you're talking about, like. I think we could totally get it to a point where it, it could, you know, it could be your, your van payment or something like that. Like, could we yeah. get it to that point where, where you could actually rely on it as like, okay, this is part of my expected income for a month. Right. That's, that's enough that it's actually like, okay, it's just like your pottery, like it's diversifying your pottery income. And, uh, it's just another piece of that that's like, okay, you know, it's we're actually getting paid for the time that we're spending doing it, and we've built up that value for ourselves over time and with the listeners and things like that. But it it shouldn't um, it shouldn't be something that's like, okay, we're just chasing it for that. You know, the 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 content of the podcast needs to be the driving force and just. You know, that still needs to be a core thing rather than like going to just throwing in a bunch of ads everywhere. <laughs> right. But yeah, uh, for sure. But yeah, there's some room for it to some places for it to go. I have no idea where it's going to go. I would suspect I mean, I was thinking for the like when I'm full time and it, I was I was building up the expectation that, you know, with the financial that this would like I would expect that this would be a piece of my financial pie that I'm like yeah thinking about um because it it, it is like it it is a part of my schedule that it's not going to be like oh well I'm just going to you know take less time doing that um and I wonder if like cuz I like cuz I like the interview side of it and I wonder if there's Ooh, maybe this would be a cool option. Maybe like, and I always thought about doing this anyways, like going to people's studios individually and like, I say like talking to them. I mean, we've kind of done that here and there, but it hasn't yeah, been, a little bit. it hasn't been published and like, it hasn't really been on the podcast that much in the way we do it, but right. like actually getting to see people's studios or talk about their process or see more of what they're doing, but also kind of like what we're talking about. Like, it's kind of weird when you do it in person. So, you know, how much of that is like interrupting their flow versus, Hey, I'm just learning more about what they do and why they do. And, um, kind of like shadowing them a little bit, but also talking to them for the podcast and getting like a more deep conversation about certain things. I don't know because you can actually see what they're doing and what their process is behind the screen. Yeah. Yeah. That would be cool. I feel like also though, we always like say these big ideas and we never do. <laughs> but it doesn't hurt to dream and like, think about the different so options true. on the table. Right. Cause I mean, so you could, true. you already go to people's studios, right? I mean, you've already done like, you did record with Julianne in her studio while we were. I did. Um, yeah. So like that was an option. Like we've sort of done that before. Um, I don't know that. It, I think you did with Heidi too, right? One mm -hmm. of the discussions, it was you and Heidi. and Yeah, yeah and we were going to do it with the Beals too, but it was too much. And I still want to do it with Joe um, here, but I don't know if that'll happen or not. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. What do you think about the um how do you how do you feel like the interviews fit in with the others like how do you feel the balance will be longer term or um 
Like, like, do you see? Well, if we do interviews every week, I'm fucking out. I'm out. <laughs> no, that's, that's out. not maintainable. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you do it, Paul. Uh, I think he releases two a week. It's ridiculous. Is it? It's fucking. Crazy. See, I think that that's part of the <laughs> what makes ours a little different is that uh, I would say we're mostly the two of us first, and then interviews is like a third. I mean, these days it's not a third; it's like half of the inter- half of the <laughs> discussion is interviews. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I See? I do enjoy them. I I sometimes I do feel guilty about taking up so much time of people's um so much of people's time when we're interviewing them. But I f- I feel like they don't they're cool with it. <laughs> Yeah, as yeah, long yeah. as they're as long as they expect it and they know that it can go long and I'm like like what if we I don't want to sign somebody up for a four hour one but like if we got to that like if we got to know. that there's no fucking way I could you'd have to do that on your own I I'd <laughs> have to like dip out it hour two I could not depend on who it is. what if it's Heidi or something okay I could do Heidi but like we could talk with Aletha for that long I feel like Oh, easy. You need to have Aletha back. I don't know. I feel like I feel like we almost need to have certain people like coming back in every so often and just yeah, not like a third host situation, but just like a you know a regular regular, regular visitor a, visitor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Won't you be my neighbor? Um. Yeah. Yeah, I feel. Like oh, some it's of, a dream. I feel. Yeah, I feel like some of it is just like <sighs> figuring out the topics to go over, but also just having some other people that you can talk about certain topics more yeah. in depth. But it doesn't have to be so specific to their process. It could just be about you know living as a creative, or you know, um, um. Like other business things, or you know, we talk about pricing with Heidi very in depth, and it doesn't have to be so like, you know, to a PowerPoint presentation of hitting all the points, but it could just be talking about um, just in general, just like how do you feel about certain things, and um, you know, this you know, social media landscape, or you know, talking with somebody about that, or. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's just so many things that um, and I wonder if like a group besides the three of us on something, if there was like a group option, you know, is that a format that could work, but also not get like so crazy that it's hard to manage if it was like four of us talking. Yeah, that would be crazy. It would be fun to do four people, I feel like like a like a bi-monthly for some. I feel like that would need to be I feel like that would need to be one that would be good in person because you can Yeah. You it wouldn't get lost in translation with the Skype and stuff because you're talking over each other with technology and stuff. Um kind of like the it's round fun. table sort of thing that we did. Yeah. It's just so fun to see people grow. Like I think about it, you know, and I think about Andrew and how we've had him on like two or three times. And how Seattle, he's grown Andrew? so much. Yeah. 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 You know, he's grown so much and like, you know, he's, he's doing better than all of us combined. And, um, yeah. And it's just been like fun to watch him grow just as, uh, alongside of us, you know? Mm-hmm. And a lot of these people that we've talked to, like we could talk to, you know, somebody that we haven't talked to in, a few years like t- Tara and Matt from and Pitchpond. Like, we we haven't yeah. talked to them in forever. Yeah, Josh, I, he came to the soda fire with me. So like that's the first time I'd seen him in a while. I, yeah. I mean, I think we saw each other at Enseco, but like that was a year then, ago. Yeah, it feels like I mean it was before two fucking weeks ago. I mean, yeah, before then it's like yeah, I can I kind of feel bad because I fall out of contact with uh, with some people. 
And uh, and I'm like, yeah, man, I want to like catch up with you or like, you know, schedule a time to come visit or whatever. And yeah. uh, but also you can a lot of this you can just pick back up where you left off and it's like, you know, no time no time lost, which mm-hmm. I think doing the podcast gives us um, the ability to have those conversations like deeper conversations that you yeah. wouldn't normally have. Like you're not gonna have those through social media with them. So yeah, for sure. All right. I think we hit everything on those. I do believe so. I do believe. All right. Well, cool. hopefully I have a good show this weekend. We'll see. I'm not going to, so. I'm not even going to, I'm not going to say what I think I'm going to make. I didn't even actually think about how much I want to make. I would love to get, I would love to get four wholesale clients. New, that's four a great new goal. wholesale clients. I feel like that's reasonable. Great goal. So. Go team. Yeah. I'll be checking in. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And we will Thanks. catch you next time. Bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to another episode of Wheel Talk. This podcast is made possible through the contributions of all of our listeners who always ask us great questions, leave us reviews, and contact with us through social media. Thanks to all the fellow makers as well who take time to be interviewed and share about their lives and businesses. And thank you to Ashley from Boldover Ceramics and Lindy from Lindy Garner Ceramics for their assistance on the Wheel Talk podcast Instagram. You are invaluable. Thank you to everybody.